is as a Catholic, um, yes. I'm not quite for sure exactly which denomination you are, um, but as a Catholic, I run into a little curiosity about the idea of public debate about religion. And the reason why I have an issue with it is because even just coming from Mass and hearing the actual word from the Bible stating, do not spread and do not shout your religion as the heathens do, why host an event exactly like this? as if it's not iconoclastic. I can promise you the quote that you gave is not from the Bible. I can promise you Jesus commanded his followers to go out and spread the good news in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. What Jesus did say, which you have probably maybe heard and maybe you're misquoting is, do not pray like the heathen who simply like to babble. Well, guess what? I'm not praying out here publicly and I'm not encouraging anybody to babble and babble and babble. Instead, I am encouraging us to think through difficult questions that you raise. I am pleading with you guys to seriously consider Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus who you read about for yourself in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you decide for yourself what you're going to do with Christ. All right. Um, my next question is, is because this has been brought up a couple times throughout uh, this past week, is the idea and concept of hell. Um, and what actions lead you to go to hell, which ones allow you to go to heaven. Right. Um, so my question is, I believe I've heard you say before, if you live a life with God, you go to heaven. If you live a life separate from Him, you will live eternally from Him, correct? Correct. All right. So, then my next question is, do certain actions determine, even if you've had a religious aspect with Jesus, do your certain actions still condemn you to hell? Paul writes very clearly in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. C.S. Lewis was walking through the faculty lounge at Oxford University. The faculty was having a debate. What's the difference between faith in Christ, Christianity, and every other major world religion? And C.S. Lewis said, oh, that's easy. Grace. Grace is different from karma, working your way through a cycle of reincarnations to nirvana. Grace is different from the five pillars of Islam. Follow the five pillars of Islam, and if you do a good enough job, maybe you'll make it. Grace is different from good old cultural Christianity in good old U.S. of A., which says, be a good boy, be a good girl, and if you're a decent person, God owes you heaven. Grace is a statement you cannot earn heaven, however many good deeds you do. Instead, a relationship with God and eternal life with God is a result of God's grace, his generosity, his love, his unmerited, undeserved, unearned forgiveness. So that's a contradiction between Jesus Christ and every other major world religion, including cultural Christianity in the good old U.S. of A. I definitely agree that the grace of God is definitely how you get into heaven. 100% not doubting that at all. I think where my question lies is having previously heard, and I'm curious about it, is I believe one student brought up their idea of their sexuality. As a homosexual student, it was believed that they were damned to hell. Is that fixed by the grace of God, by being a full follower of God, or not? And that was their main question to you. There is no sin too big for Christ to be unable to forgive. And three weeks ago, I was at Texas State University speaking. This man stepped out of the crowd and said, I'm homosexual. What do you have to say to me? And I started explaining to him why the Bible says he's valuable. It has nothing to do with his sexual practice. It has to do with the fact he's created the image of God. I began to talk about sexuality when another guy raised his hand and said, Clip, i got to say something. I said, okay, fine, go ahead, say something. He said, I want you all to know that I was born gay. I want you all to know that recently I've come to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And a guy burst out from the other side of the crowd saying, oh gosh, you're not going to have sex anymore? And the guy said, no, I didn't say that. I said, now I have put my faith in Christ. I have received his forgiveness. I am seeking to obey him as Lord of my life. And I don't know what the future holds, but I'm following Christ today. I could not applaud that young man at Texas State enough. He was absolutely outstanding. 
It's exactly what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? That is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's that simple. It's not, it's not that complex. Okay. So essentially the faith of the mustard seed, homily, essentially. Great parable Jesus taught, yes, but what's your point? So I'm just clarifying that it's the faith of the mustard seed is what saves you. It's not the hellfire and brimstone homily. It's the idea that faith in God is what determines your life. It's exactly what the author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 11.1. 1. He says, writes, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then in verse 6 he writes, it is impossible to please God without faith because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In other words, God's not going to play cat and mouse with you. If you want to find God, you will find him. The only reason a person doesn't find God is for the same reason that a criminal does not find the police. He's running away. If you want to keep running away from God, God gave you free will and you can keep running. But if you have any desire to know God, God loves you and he will honor that. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but he loves you and he wants you to draw you to himself, and he will do that. Okay. Um, I believe my final question is, I heard you mention earlier today, um, as I was passing on my way to Mass, uh, mentioning that ethics were, are nothing without God. Explain that to me a little bit, please. Yes, sir. I never once have said ethics are nothing without God. What I have repeatedly said is, if there is no God... Morality is relative. If there is no God, there are no objective moral absolutes. Why? If there is no mind prior to the human mind, then who creates right and wrong? Obviously the human mind. If that is your view, that it's the human mind that creates right and wrong, I hope you're not arrogant enough to think that your definition from your mind of right and wrong is superior to the person's definition standing on your right or left, or living in Papua New Guinea, or living in Tanzania. Because if right and wrong are simply the creation of the human mind, then obviously there is no objective moral absolute. The only way there can be an objective moral absolute of any kind is if there is some mind prior to the human mind who creates and defines right versus wrong. In other words, an atheist is someone who says, I am limiting reality to matter and energy. No spiritual being called God. Matter and energy, that's all there is to reality. If that is true, if you believe that, I want to hold you to live that out, which means morality, this intangible value of justice and goodness, is simply a taste, a prejudice of an individual, a culture, a power elite. That's all it is. And what I want to do is, in the same way that you're going to have trouble with me, if I say, I follow Christ, and then you watch me go out and womanize, that's hypocrisy. So I'm going to accuse the atheist of intellectual hypocrisy if they tell me there is no God, morality is relative, but you should not have a racist attitude. Baloney. If morality is relative, don't you dare use the word should not, ought not. Instead, speak honestly and say, from my perspective, that is wrong, but your perspective is different from mine. I'm not right. You're not wrong. It's all a cosmic crapshoot. That's all I'm asking for consistency. The same way you demand of me, Cliff, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, I better not watch you go out and womanize. If you do, there's a word to describe you, Cliff, hypocrite. And you're right. You're absolutely correct. Similarly, I'm going to tell you that if you're going to tell me you're agnostic or atheist, which means morality is relative, but you think that racism is absolutely evil, you're an intellectual hypocrite. It's not absolutely evil. It's just evil from your perspective or from your cultural bias. Why pray? Why trust in Christ? Why believe in God? Because our supreme goal in life is to please and enjoy God, according to Jesus Christ. You're not an accident. 
you and I were created to please and enjoy God for eternity. When that becomes your aim, you can't go wrong. We always are in the presence and sight of God, and that is why prayer is so important. We always are in the presence and the sight of God. Prayer is intelligent conversation with God. Prayer is seeking to connect spiritually with God and grow a spiritual relationship with Him. God is spirit. And at the deepest level of reality, God wants to connect with your soul, with your spirit. In order for that to happen, the ego must shrink and the soul must connect with God. What is total openness? Total openness with God is honesty before God. It's flowing in God's direction. What is sin? Sin is where I substitute myself for God. What is salvation? What is putting your faith in Christ? It's allowing God, Jesus Christ, to substitute himself on the cross for me, to forgive me, and to give me eternal life. Key to developing this relationship with God is prayer. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, not our cosmic muscle, our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed means deep awe, profound respect for God and for his name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In prayer, I am to learn to submit my will to God's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer ties me in to an accurate view of reality. This earth is very real. It's an incredible gift from God. Your body is very real, an amazing gift from God. But also there's heaven, there's eternity, in addition to this temporal, time-bound world. There's eternity, eternal life in heaven, with a resurrection body, with other people who we will be loving and relating to, and we'll be relating to Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Jesus said, pray, give us this day our daily bread. That's not begging, that is expressing our dependence upon God for our daily bread. God has given you and me abilities and talents, and to trust God does not mean to be lazy and irresponsible in using our talents. No, it means that we are to work, but ultimately we trust God because he's the one who's given us the gifts to work, to make money, to buy bread, to have food. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Part of prayer is asking God for forgiveness for the wrong that I've done. That's how reconciliation takes place. That's how two estranged parties come back together again, by asking for forgiveness and by granting forgiveness. And so we are to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Because reconciliation, living together in intimate relationships is so important to God. We are to follow that path of forgiving and reconciling. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? Because temptation is real. Why? Because you've got a free will and I've got a free will. Why do we pray for God to strengthen us against temptation? Because we have a sinful nature. We're mixed up kids. Part of us wants to do good. Part of us wants to do evil. We are confused kids. And that is why we need Christ's forgiveness. That's why we need his help to stand against temptation and to live lives of integrity, lives of forgiving, lives of compassion, lives of honesty. And then as we pray, we can get to know God better. And part of prayer is not just talking, it's also listening. Listening to God speak to us by his Holy Spirit as a still small voice deep within our souls. God is spirit. You are not just a hunk of primordial slime evolved to a higher order. You are a human being with a soul. You have a mind, a conscience. You have a free will. There's a real you, there's a real me. And it's at that deep level that God wants to connect with you. 
Have you connected with God by putting your faith in Christ? By allowing His Holy Spirit to make you alive to God? You can make that decision by very simply but profoundly trusting in Christ. God bless you as you make that most important decision. I think where it's still not clear is if the idea of morality being objective for each individual person is an issue of consistency as well as hypocrisy. So then how is it civilizations that are based off of not Christianity are living in an idea as a universal so universal social construct and contract, excuse me, that allows this mentality of do well to your other social human being. All that societies that live without Christianity still acknowledge that. How is that still not morally equal? For the same reason that every atheist friend of mine does good. Because although my atheist friend intellectually says it's all relative, they cannot live it out. Every single one of my atheist friends is an exemplary moral person. Why? Because they have a conscience and a rational mind that ties them into an intangible value called justice. And so obviously what I'm trying to do with you and with my atheist friends at home is to shake you guys to think more clearly that if I believe that morality is relative, why do I find it impossible to live out? If I believe that morality is relative, why when I go to every culture around the world does it seem that we're all reading off the same, same sheet of music? We all have tremendous agreement that adultery and murder are really, really, really wrong. Good. And I think by far the most reasonable answer to that is because we all are created in the image of God, which means we all have, every atheist, every agnostic, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Jew, we all have this incredibly innate drive to love, to do good, to be rational, to honor our conscience. And that is one of the strongest pieces of evidence that some type of God exists. Stuart, what are your thoughts? From an evolutionary perspective, you could say, well, in order for a certain species to grow, to better themselves, they want to be unselfish. They want to be moral. The problem with that type of thinking, though, if you go back to ancient civilizations, ancient people groups, there was a group type of survival. You had to join a group. So that means that if you join a certain group and you live morally and unselfishly within that group, then certainly maybe morals came from an evolutionary perspective. But all of a sudden, if you start hopping into another group and showing love for your neighbor and for a different group, you're being selfish in your unselfishness. So it starts to fall apart. And then one, one that he didn't hit that I would just speak to lastly is from an individual perspective, going back originally to the start of humanity, the strong eat the weak. So how can you get morality, human rights, coming from grew up red, red in tooth and claw? That makes zero sense. That's a schizophrenic understanding of morality that an atheist really can't back up. And that's why many people say moral obligation is the number one piece of evidence for the Christian belief or some transcendent reality. So we don't have to call it objective moral values. We can simply say feelings versus a sense of obligation. Couldn't you argue that the idea and concept of morality comes with the growth and transition from being barbarians to civilization instead of just necessarily the adaptation of religion? Yeah. yeah. Well, then how do you explain all the atheistic regimes? How do you explain the greater populace that was taken in Nazi Germany? How about communist China? So certainly you could, you could say the populace gets to this point of a type of adaptation, but from a naturalistic worldview, no, selective adaptation is not gonna get you to the point of saying that we have moral obligation. It can get you to the point of saying we have moral feeling, but no, I don't see how you can still make that jump. That is a large leap of faith. I, I think that's a faith position. I think moral. I think the thing that we both equally agree on is the idea that morality is objective. Or excuse me, subjective to the actual individual person. But another idea. So you bring up the idea of why were people taken during Nazi Germany? 
but the same question could also be led, how is it that Christian regimes have also led to the downfall and attacks against other people as well? It plays a point of both sides. Yeah. And that's why Hitler was such a major fan of Friedrich Nietzsche. Because he said, yes, we need to wake up and live with a type of fear, a type of self-loathing, a type of even violent tendencies towards other people groups, and be okay with it. And then he followed it up with, all my atheist friends are simply stealing from the Christian faith when they live lives that are dedicated towards helping the weak, helping the oppressed, living with a type of moral obligation, even though they say we believe in subjective morals, that they're simply feelings. So do you see the consistency there of Nietzsche and, and even Hitler? It's pretty impressive. And that's why the Nietzsche types today are calling out the new atheists who don't go far enough like Nietzsche, like the existentialists, who were much more intellectually honest. I, I get that 100%. And I understand the concept of eight, uh, the, I understand the relation that you're trying to make between Nietzsche atheism to a lack of morality. My question is still, if morality is directly, relinked, is directly linked to religion, and Christianity itself, and Christianity brings us closer to this construct of justice, as he was mentioning, then why is it still that Christian regimes still have demonstrated well, atrocities against people? More, more, more than what? I said, why have not more of anything? Why have they demonstrated monstrosities against people? Total hypocrisy. And that's why I'm so comfortable saying that, because Jesus went against moral hypocrisy with the Pharisees his entire life. He was going to call them out in how they were warring against the Roman Empire because he knew that that wouldn't bring shalom, peace, love. He knew that we were aiming for an eternal kingdom, not a political kingdom here on earth. And so it's the hypocritical peace. And you look at, sure, the Crusades, sure, the Inquisition, Salem witch trials, Absolutely, a ton. So I, I would never, again, that's not, that's really not talking about the point here. You're getting into another realm of hypocritical thinking that doesn't touch the transcendent view of moral obligation. Because all mess up, all live very great lives. But at the end of the day, you, you can't say, and I've been saying this all week, you can't judge a worldview, a religion, atheism, based off its abuses. I could stand out here again and say, Mao Zedong, communism, killed at least 40 million people. Stalinism, at least 20 million people. Hitler, we have no idea, could have been up to 15 million. Pol Pot, at least 3 million. So, so that, that's the abuse, but I'm not gonna say just because atheistic regimes have abused and killed so many people that atheism isn't true. Why are you valuable? In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the Lord says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God has a plan, a purpose for your life and for mine. Why are you valuable? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Because God gives you value, that's why you're valuable. Why are you valuable? In Psalm 100 verse 3 we read, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. You become one of His. And He tenderly cares for you and watches over you. Why are you valuable? In Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, we read, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Do you understand? God created you. God put together the process of being born after nine months of growing in your mother's womb. God 
formed you in your mother's womb. He put together the natural processes that allow you to grow and develop and to be born a human being. Why are you valuable? In Isaiah 49, 15 and 16, we read, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Yes, it is possible that a mother turns away from the child that she brought into the world. Very rare, but very possible, and it does occur. But God says, I promise I will never turn my back on you. If you turn your back on God, if you turn your back on Christ, that is your decision. But God loves you with an unconditional love. He treasures you. He values you. Is there going to be a separation between some people and God for eternity? Yes. But that is because people have turned their backs on God and gone their own way. In fact, I think I know what the theme song of hell will be. I did it my way. God says, come back to me. That is what Jesus consistently taught in the parable of the prodigal son. He told about a father whose son ran away, but the son waited, but the father waited patiently for the son to return home. God is waiting patiently for you to return to him. He loves you with a love that's patient. He loves you with a love that is kind. He loves you with a love that is not determined by your performance. God's love flows from his inner being. He is love. Faith in Christ is responding to God's love, to Christ's love in love. That is what is to motivate my faith in Christ. I understand that he loves me so much so that he sacrificed his life on a cross for me. I can't turn away from that kind of love. I have to respond to that love by loving him by trusting in Him. Have you trusted in Christ? Have you responded to His love for you by trusting in Him? You can right now, simply but profoundly. Ask Him for forgiveness. Put your faith in Him and commit your life to Him. God bless you as you make that most important decision to trust in Jesus Christ. I'm one of the pastors of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 930 at Grace Farms, located at 365 Luke's Wood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'd love to personally invite you to join us this Sunday for our 930 service. Thanks for spending these few minutes with us. Have a great day.